So we're back. It's part two of lesson three. Um, Luke asked an excellent question, which I'm going to go over. Um, okay, I've already created. Uh, Luke, if you're okay, and you posted in the chat, so I'm just going to read your question. How do I know that I've checked HTTPS and individual user accounts? Is there a way I can easily check to make sure I implemented those so I don't have to make a new project? Yes, absolutely. Um, all you have to do is start your server without debugging because there's going to be two very obvious clues. The first one is whether it runs under HTTP or HTTPS. So first of all, you'll see HTTPS in the address and also all the port numbers, the default port is always starts with 443 for SSL. So if your application is running and the first three numbers of the port are 443 and you see the HTTPS, yes, you've done that. You've enabled HTTPS correctly. Whether you've identified user uh, individual accounts, also easy, because when you do, you get register and login links up here in your nav bar. If you created a project and you do not have these up here, it means you left the authentication defaulting to none. So Visual Studio does not create these links or these pages in your project. So as long as you see HTTPS 443 register login, you did it correctly. Does that help? Good, a very good question. I'm glad you brought that up because probably other people were wondering the same thing. So those are your easy ways to check. Okay, so um, last week we did have the small discussion board posting that was worth, uh, that was one of our five le graded learning activities. So we're going to do another one now. It doesn't, this is going to take very long. I'd say maybe 10, 15 minutes tops. Um, so it's going to be a small group activity. So in D2L, I believe under other tools, there is a link for groups. Um, I didn't remake the group, so at the same group you were in in week one. So there's five groups in the class. Everyone in the class is in one of the five groups. So you're going to check, are you in group one, two, three, four, or five? And then you're going to click this link here. So with our item is more on view syntax. And I made a note that it's graded. So open up this file in a new browser tab. It's going to jump you here to a PowerPoint slide deck. Please do not download this file. We need to click on edit in browser here so that we can all be working in the same file simultaneously. So you'll edit it in your browser. You're not going to download it to a desktop PowerPoint app. And then I'm going to go over the instructions in here. So there's each group is assigned to a slide. So if you are in group one on D2L, here's your slide. I've pasted in a snippet of Razor View code. I've told you which file in the project has this line of code. And then together, I'm going to pause my recording in a minute and my screen share. And I'm going to set up five breakout rooms. I know they're not your favorite, but we're not going to be in there for long. In your breakout room, so if you're in group one, you're going to join breakout room one. And together, I want you to do a little research on what does this code mean and put in an explanation on your slide and also include your names because you do get marks for doing this activity. If you're in group two, here's your code in your slide group three, group four, and group five. If you are watching this recording after class, you are not live with us on Monday, you can still do this activity on your own. I've got, starting on slide seven, I've got a bunch of slides identical that say asynchronous users. Find another piece of ASP view code. Views only, not in the, not in the controllers or the models or somewhere else. Paste another snippet of new ASP view code in here and then put in an explanation and your name. So teach us what does this code do? If you are working asynchronously, you will have until next Sunday at five o'clock to do this. For the 25 of us or so who are here, which is the bulk of the class right now. Yeah, 20, 
24 of 29 students are here, which is great. I'm going to give you about 10, 15 minutes to do that, and that's an easy 2 3% for your final grade. Okay, are there any questions before about the instructions before I start the breakout rooms? You will be able to move yourself into the appropriate breakout room. Once I start them, there'll be a breakout sessions link. You can click it and you just click join beside room one, two, three, four, or five. Okay, so this should not take all that long. Probably 10 minutes is enough, 10, 15 minutes is enough, plenty of time for the activity. And we'll come back and see what you found short. Just resume my recording. But what explanations we uh, came up with. So Luke, Adam, Chris, and Preston were telling us what this partial name. So it's used for rendering a partial view. So the name of the partial we want, um, and it's done asynchronously. So we actually see this login partial up here in our navigation bar. Right? If we look at our layout file, we've got our home and categories index, and then at the right end of our nav bar, we've got this partial name. So what's in this login partial? If we open it up. We can see it's just a piece of the nav bar. So we have a separate UL class. And then we have some logic here, kind of like we sort of did created similar logic in our PHP course with the app we built, um, our LAMP food app, where we said if the user was signed in, we showed their username and log out. And if the user was anonymous, we showed them register and log in. So this isn't a complete page, it's a partial that we can inject or we can render with this partial name. So it allows us to make a reusable kind of HTML component that we can put into different places on the site. Okay, that's a good explanation. Thank you, group one. So group two, their code was from that login partial We've got a using statement and to inject statements of the sign in and user manager class. So the using, yeah, it encapsulates our identity user. So we can use our sign in and user manager class. So we're making a reference on the first line. And Mason and Xavier explain that user manager is a class for managing users. It has built in CRUD functionality and provides additional functionality for things like claims and roles and other advanced security concepts like password hashing and user validation. So our login is gonna use those and the sign-in manager is an API for doing sign-in. So regular sign-in as well as things like two-factor authentication, logout, password checking. Excellent description. Thanks, Ivan. And the identity library basically is for working with the Entity Framework Core and managing user data. Okay, so we'll come to this, I think in uh, lesson six, we'll be working with this more. Very good, and nice here, little uh, block separating out your notes, really helpful. So Megan, Austin, Andreas, uh, Owen, Ethan, and Adil had this render body statement, which we also find in a shared layout. So it's in charge of rendering page contents that are not in the this file itself. So it renders, in this case, the individual page content gets rendered inside of the main tag. So this is where the individual page content is pulled into our layout template. And we may have multiple layout templates in a site. Uh, I'm not sure if we've talked about this before. Can you think of any examples of, so right now we've only got this one layout template, right? All our pages are basically using this one layout file. What would be a scenario where we might have different layout templates? Each one of them would use this render body statement to inject page content. Can you think of any scenario where we may want to have, yeah, so an admin and a user site. Did we talk about this before? I know I did in my other class camera if we talked about it last week. Okay, we did. Can you think of any other example or scenario where we might have different layout templates? 
Yeah, okay, so got a great example, Chris. So the browse template on Netflix when we're browsing is a different template from the watch. So we may have different layout templates there. Or if we want to enable themes, maybe we want a light theme and a dark theme on our site. When the user toggles the theme, we're going to use a different layout, for example. But every one of them, any layout file is going to need this render body statement that we have on line 35 in order to inject individual page content. Okay, so Sammy and Sumer got the render scripts statement. So it checks if the JavaScripts are required. So if it's false, it won't render the script unless it's necessary. If it's true, it will always render the client-side JavaScripts. And then in our add category form, or I guess we called it create today. So yeah, we have this ASP4 for generating the label and input that match the property name in our controller. We had this validation summary, so we didn't work with that. We worked with this, this span ASP validation four. So for example, if our name was empty, we saw an error message in red. So we can validate either at the individual property level, or we could use this validation summary to validate all of the model at once. We can do either or both. So thanks, Brandon, Quinlan, and Chris. So I will enter marks for everybody who participated in the activity. Again, if you are watching the video later, and I know there are a few people who are signed into the WebEx room but didn't join a breakout session, you still have until next Sunday, you can pick a slide of your own, go find a view code snippet, paste it in, and repeat what the, the work the other groups have done, add a description and add your name onto one of the slides down at the bottom of the slide deck. Um, are there any questions from anybody about any of the little code snippets that we've just looked at? Do you need to go out again? Sorry, folks. I have this little stinker here. She's only a couple months. She's scratching at the door. So excuse me, I got to get up and let her out again so she doesn't poop on my floor. Any questions? All right. Now this part's gonna be a little ass backwards. Normally I kind of do a bit of a lecture and then we do an activity. We've sort of done our activities. I'm just gonna go over a few slide notes here. I'm not gonna read all of this to you. There's lots of, this is, 50 slides, and I have posted this as a reference for you on D2L. Just a couple highlights of things that are relevant. Um, actually, I haven't uploaded these slides, so I will. After I go over them, I will post them in the week three folder for you. Okay. Um, so we know what views are for already. So we've got this basic templating engine and the syntax, we'll hear the word razor. So that just refers to this syntax where our server side code is denoted with an at symbol. We know our views are going to be typically inside of a subfolder related to the controller that invokes them. So we've already discovered this and that typically our view names and method names are gonna be, are gonna correspond. So we've worked with strongly typed views a little bit now. So we've used the view bag, but the view bag has no typing. So by generating, and this was kind of the example we did last week, we could create some mock data and use the view bag, but then it's not strongly typed at all in our view. Whereas when we use a strongly typed model, like we did here, or in our index view, we then also get code hinting. So for example, when I type at C dot, 
And it gives me the name attribute here. So most of the time we're going to work with strongly typed views. Um, we talked about that last week and using I enumerable for a list. We also have this construct. We're probably not going to use them in this class, but I just want to let you know these are here. Um, so Microsoft also has a, 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 an object called a view model. So one of the questions that came up in class last week was, well, you know, like we build our create view and it's modeled on the category model. We want to display the category ID and name inputs. That's fine. But what if we want to display information from multiple models in a single view? How do we do this? Like, do we make multiple model statements up here or how does this work? We've got a couple of options for this. So let's say so we have two ways of doing this. Let's say we have a customer model and an order model, and we want to display both customer data and order data in the same view. There's two ways we can do this. If the models are related, then we can simply use, typically we use the parent object and we automatically have access to the child object. But sometimes we wanna display data from models that are not related in the same view. So in this case, we define a view model where we combine the properties from two different models and then we can use the view model to build our view. Probably we won't do this in our course, but is it possible in MVC? Yes, it is. So that's what the view model allows us to do. And there's kind of an example here of what that might look like. So if we're building a shopping cart, that would just show a list of products, but also have a total and a message. We might define a view model and then build a shopping cart view based on this class. So something like this. We've looked at adding views. So I've just kind of screen, we've kind of screenshotted what we've done. And here again is the list of view templates. Create, delete, details, edit, empty, empty without a model and list. And we'll be working with these templates more through the course more next week as well. Explanation about our script libraries, our partials. So some of the things we've talked about and some of the other kind of features of how Razor syntax works. So for example, what happens if we have an at symbol in the middle? Well, it's smart enough to know this is an email address and is not going to treat it like server side code. So there's some also some code samples here of, you know, for example, doing math in a view. So I will post these slides, I'm not going to go over it, but it's a useful reference for you. Um, as you're building your views in your assignment, you may want to check some of the formatting and examples here and descriptions of layouts, partials, etc. Okay, so I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. I've given you the basics. Um, I will upload the slides in here. Apologize for not putting them in here. So I will just take care of that right now so I don't forget. Let me move this up here. I don't think working with .NET MVC views is very difficult. Um, you'll just need some practice with it in terms of, and you'll probably encounter and have to do a little bit of lookup about some syntax items that you may want in, in terms of doing your assignment. Um, okay, we're gonna do one more thing today. We're going to leave views alone and we're going to 
this last thing we're going to do is kind of looking forward to next week's class and the assignment. So next week's class is probably the single most important class of the whole semester. You definitely want to be here because we are going to connect our pro we're going to connect our project to our database. We're going to build our models and then generate our database tables based on those models and then we're going to scaffold controllers and views. And that's largely the guts of what you're doing in assignment 1. So almost all the work you have to do for assignment 1, we're going to do next week in class with our bookstore. So what we're just going to do now is I'm just going to set up the database and I'm going to show you, whoops, and there's a wasp in here. I'm going to set up two SQL Server databases. I'm going to set up one locally that I'm going to use for the last chapter. I recommend you run this database locally because it's going to be faster in class. I'm also going to show you how to set up a database in the Azure portal where you're going to set up the database for your assignment. So I recommend creating two. The bookstore database on your local SQL server, your assignment database in the Azure portal. And we'll connect them up to the web project next week. So the first thing I'm going to do, I just have to quickly deal with my wonky SQL server. So bear with me for a second. I'm just going to have to restart this. So you can open up SQL Server Management Studio, which I believe you should have from last semester. If you don't have Management Studio or SQL Server, you can just watch this part and you can install these tools on your own before next week's class. So the links are here. So on D2L, under Weekly Learning Tools and Resources, if you scroll down, there's a link to download SQL Server. You can, I'd probably recommend the Developer Edition, and then the link to Management Studio is here. Am I right that most of you or all of you have SQL Server and Management Studio already? Okay, that's good, Luke. So this is the server itself, and Management Studio is the interface we use for interacting with SQL Server databases, kind of like MySQL Workbench, but a lot better. Other people, maybe give me a thumbs up if you have these tools. If nobody has them, then I'll, I need to know. No, not the profiler. Okay, so I, I guess I was, okay, only Workbench. Okay, that's for my SQL. Uh, sir, uh, sorry for cutting you in like this, but for the last three semesters, we've only used MySQL. We have never used uh, okay, I wasn't Microsoft sure. SQL Server. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I know some students in the Comp 1098 in the C-sharp class some instructors use SQL Server at the end of that course and some don't. So I had assumed that like in one of my other class, most of the students already had the tools. Okay, so if you do not have these tools, which it sounds like most of you don't, okay, that's, that's fine. So let's go ahead. It, the download will take a while. So I want you to install SQL Server Developer. So you can get the developer edition here. A couple of options to choose when you're running the install. I'm just gonna mention two things. I'll put them in the chat as well. When the install runs, most, for, most, for not, most of it, you can just accept all the defaults, but there's two things I want you to make sure you choose. One of them is, it will give you a big checkbox with a whole bunch of features. You don't need the whole feature list. 
You just need the feature at the top, which is called, I'm putting it in the chat. So the feature to install here is the database engine. This is the actual server itself. So if you don't check any of the features, it will install the SQL server program, but it won't actually give you a database server to create databases. Yes, you can select basic install Preston. It may not ask you for the features. In fact, maybe I could ask someone to share their screen as you're doing it, because I could walk you through it and everybody could see. Megan, it's the same program. You can download it from the Azure Education Portal or you can download it for free here. It's the same program, so you can use either one. So maybe someone who's running the install would be willing to share their screen. So make sure that the database engine feature, you check it off if you're given that option. The other option has to do, you're going to be given an option of how do you want to authenticate? The default is Windows authentication. The other choice is SQL server authentication. For your own computer, it's easiest just to leave it to Windows authentication, but I think there's a button there. Again, I'll put this in the chat. You may need to click add current user. So that way your Windows login will have access to the server. Maybe let me know when you're running the install if you get these options. Does it ask you for the feature list? And do you need to add your Windows account to the authentic to the list of authorized users? My setup was a little different from yours. So I want to make sure I give you the instructions that you need to get it installed properly. And it is big, so it may take a little while. Uh, sir, do we download this free specialized edition or do we scroll down and then download the 2019? This one here, developer, okay. SQL server developer 2019. All right, thank you. Uh, Rich, I've got yes. it installed, and I see those options at like the first thing when I when I launched the server management studio. I don't think they're features that you have to check. Okay. Install. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think I've installed. I think I may have enterprise, so I may have different features. So I had to choose a bunch of stuff. So if you so you didn't really have to choose anything. You just accepted all the defaults. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So after you install the SQL Server Developer, then you can go and install Management Studio. Management Studio may come with it. I think it also depends on your install. For me, I had to install Management Studio separately. The Developer Edition may come with Management Studio. I'm honestly not sure. Okay, Mason. Yeah, you can do it in Visual Studio. It's just, it's, it's slow and sort of clunky. And the, the feature set is really limited within Visual Studio. But now I understand how you're able to do it. Management Studio is much faster and, and it's much better. We, we can do a lot more, a lot more easily in Management Studio. So that's why we want to install it.
So maybe you can just give me a, uh, like, give me a thumbs up in WebEx. I think you've got the response or reaction once you've got things set up. Okay, thanks, Luke. I'll just pause the recording right now until people are caught up. So I'm going to go through the process first of setting. Okay, Adam, yeah, it, it can happen. I will record this so you can always follow the recording and do it after. And you can set up an appointment with me if you need some help. It does happen. So what I'm going to do is open up Management Studio. I can see that my local service, you don't have to click anything after it's installed. I just wanted to know, yes, you can now install SSMS, which should install much more quickly than the server itself. The server is much bigger, SSMS is smaller. So I'm going to want to use SSMS now to actually connect to my local service, which I can see both in my window services list. I can see it's running. I can also see it in my SQL server configuration manager that my service is running. So I'm gonna open up Management Studio. I would recommend pinning it to your start menu because we're gonna use it most weeks. So typically when I'm sitting down to work on a .NET project, First thing I do is I open Visual Studio, I open Management Studio. I need those programs basically anytime I'm working on a .NET site. So I open Management Studio. And just like in Workbench, the first thing it's gonna bring up is a little connection window. So what server do you wanna to connect to? So by default, it should have your local server name here, which typically is just your computer name. And if we left the default, for Windows authentication, we should just be able to connect. Now your screen may look like this instead. The server name may be blank, so you may not see it. If this is the case, finding it is quite easy. In the server name drop down, we just expand the drop down, and at the bottom, we have this option to browse for more. So you click browse for more, and then we've got two tabs, local and network. So under the local server tab and our database engine, if our server is running, it'll show your computer name here. And then I should just be able to choose my local server and click okay. I'm gonna leave authentication as Windows and I can just click connect. And this connects me in the object explorer I can see down here, and you'll notice this window works quite fast because I'm all, the server's on the same machine. So if I expand my databases, here are the databases I've created in my Tuesday and Thursday classes. We're doing an international food shop and a pet store. So to make a new database is really simple here. I just click on databases, right click and choose new database and give it a name, I'll call it in Pascal case, the last chapter. Make sure there are no spaces in the database name. All I need to do is name it. And I can click okay. So now I have a, notice it doesn't show up here yet. In my object explorer, I just click refresh and it's here. And you can see how fast this is, it's all quite quite speedy because I'm working on my local server. So for our in-class application, I recommend that your database is local. There's a need to use this online in the Azure portal. But I do wanna show you how to set up a database in the Azure portal, because that's what you're gonna to need to use for your assignment. So we can actually set up your assignment database right now. I'm gonna set up the last chapter also in Azure, but as I said, you only need this one locally. So first step to using the Azure portal 
is to, if you haven't already signed up for the Azure student offer, you're going to want to go here. I'm going to put the link in the chat. So if Microsoft knows you are a student, they give you a hundred dollars US worth of credits in Azure. You do not need a credit card. You just sign up for this. Uh, I would probably use your Georgian email for this. You can try using your Lakehead email. Actually, it might work. I don't know, but I know it definitely works with a Georgian email account. And then they will send you a verification email. You just click on it and verify you're a student. So you'll go here and click start free. I can't do that. I'm, I'm already log logged in, so this doesn't work very well for me. I think I would have to go back here and I'll probably try it in a private window. So when you click start free, yeah, it'll want you to sign in with a Microsoft account. You can also use your GitHub account even if you like. But probably best use your Georgian credential because it will be easy for them to see you are a student. Once you've done this, we're then going to sign into the main Azure portal by putting the link in the chat at portal.azure.com. So this is kind of like hosting central. So you'll get familiar. You may even want to bookmark the Azure portal URL because we're going to be here a lot. So here is Azure. Azure is much more, this is actually where how, why Microsoft's been making all their money the last few years. Not so much in selling software. If we see Microsoft kind of made a huge comeback over the last few years. And it's actually mostly due to their cloud services, to Azure. Let's see how they've been doing over the last three years, you can see their stock price as close to tripled. Yeah. And a lot of this is due to Azure. So AWS, Amazon Web Services, which is also how Amazon makes most of their money. Incidentally, Amazon sort of invented cloud hosting. So most of Microsoft's profit is actually from Azure. So what's here? There's a ton of stuff in Azure. We're not going to use most of it. But if we go and click on create a resource, a resource is just a service, you can see all the stuff Azure offers. It's got solutions for artificial intelligence, data analytics, blockchain, databases, which we will use, um, Internet of Things. It's got an IoT hub to connect IoT devices, um, media, monitoring, networking. We're basically interested in, it's got storage. We're basically interested in web and databases. So for now, after I click on create a resource, I'm going to go to databases and I want to create an SQL database. So we've created an SQL database locally, but now I'm going to create one live in the Azure portal. I'm going to click on create. It should find, I'm going to pick my Azure for students subscription. And then we've got this option here, resource group. So a resource group is a collection of resources that share the same lifecycle permissions and policies. So if I'm going to build five different applications in the Azure portal, and each one is going to have a database and a web application, I would have 10 resources. I can group those. I might make a group for each separate project, and each group will have one database and one web application. So I'm going to create a new resource group. We'll just call it Monday, Fall 21. So I'm going to put both the database and then next week when I build the web application on Azure, I'm going to put those in the same resource group. It's the same applications. So I'm going to group them together. I'll give my resource group a name. And now I have to create a name for my database and a name for the server. 
So the names I'm going to use are probably going to be different from the names you're going to use. Remember, I'm setting up my last chapter database here. You guys are setting up your assignment database. So I'll call mine um, the last chapter, but you might call yours, I don't know, Comp 2084 assignment. And then I have to create a new server. So I'm going to click Create New. And again, I'm going to have to give my server a name. I'll use the last chapter again. And it will be a suff suffix with .database.windows.net. So I recommend, you know, give yours a more descriptive name. And then I have to set up a username and password for my database. It will recommend a geographic location that's near me. Azure has data centers around the world. I'm going to default to Eastern US. So I'm going to leave that option because the free services are not available in all the locations. Now, before I click OK here, I'm going to take these credentials and I'm going to put them in a file. The reason is to connect my application up next week, I'm going to need these credentials. Seven days from now, I may not remember them. So always a good idea whenever you create a database to put the database name, server name, username, and password in a text file that's backed up securely somewhere. I have mine on OneDrive. So that I can add these credentials to my web project next week. One word. All 21 Azure credentials. Okay, so my Monday class. So there's my server. My database name. The username that I just created. So I'm going to save those credentials because I will need them next week. And this way I don't have to remember them. I'll save my file. And then I'm just going to click the OK button here in this new server window. Tom, and stop RK. Now I want to make a couple of changes to the configuration. Notice the compute and storage option. When we create our server, we have a whole range of choices. And by default, the default option, 2 v cores, 32 gigs of storage, a Gen 5, this is way more powerful machine than we need. If we use this, it's going to eat up our Azure credits like immediately. So I'm going to click this configure database option. And I'm going to change the service tier. So it defaults to this general purpose. I'm going to change this down to the basic. This is the cheapest. So I'm changing the service tier from the general purpose down to basic. That has an estimated cost of $6 Canadian a month. So I want the cheapest option, which I will apply. They offer backups like across different regions. We don't really need to worry about that. So it should just give us two gigs of storage. That's all we need. Yeah, Mason, you can delete it or you can keep it and you can just use the one you already made. But if you've got stuff in the database, then yeah, you probably want to delete it and make a new one. And then I'll just click this review and create button. 
So my storage is just the basic two gig. And I've stored the credentials in a text file. And then I just click create. So this is going to take a few minutes to run. It's going to first create the server itself on Azure. And then once the server is live, it has to create the database inside of the server. So this will run for a couple of minutes. And when it completes, we can try to connect to it through Management Studio. So I'm connected locally, but I'll also need to be able to use Management Studio so that I can work with and view the database we're setting up in the Azure portal. So you really only need to do this process once because you're going to use this one Azure database for assignment two, three, and four. You're not going to need to make another database in Azure besides this one. The config settings, you want to change the compute option to basic. That's the only thing you have to change. I think it defaults the compute settings and storage default to like general. And we change from general to basic, which is like a tenth the cost. So it's created the server. It's now creating my database. And the portal will tell us when this is done. Now, I will mention one other thing related to Azure just as I let this run. Um, we are working on, so Microsoft offers a number of certification exams at different levels for using Azure. And we are hoping to be able to offer those exams in Bear, at the Barry campus starting in 2022. Normally those exams cost somewhere between $100 and $200 US. Um, we actually should have some voucher codes for students interested in studying for the exams. So you study for the exams on your own, but you may be able to write those exams at the college and have those paid. So I will just show you this. I'll put the link in. So here's the Azure Fundamentals exam. I actually did this exam a few months ago. And they've got some self-study materials here. There's also material on LinkedIn Learning. So if you're interested in these, I'll have more information in December whether we'll be able to offer these exams at the college. Um, Ivan, I don't... Your, I, your Georgian email is blocked where? I don't understand. It's blocked by the Azure portal or you can't log into it. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not clear. Okay, if you can't log into your Georgian email, then email IT support at georgiancollege.ca. And they will help you. Okay, so my database, hmm, okay, I wasn't aware of that. So my database is here. It says the status is online. Um, there was an option when it was done that just says go to resource, but just from the home panel, it'll show you your recent resources, or you can go to all resources. and you'll see it here. So I'm gonna click on, so notice there's two option, two items called the last chapter. One is the server and one is the database. I want the database. I can click on it and close that blade. It says my server is online. It's running in their Eastern US data center. Here's my server name. So now I wanna to try to connect to it through Management Studio. 
I'm going to go back down here. And I've got this little window here that says registered servers. If you don't see this window, you can turn it on through the view menu and click registered servers. That'll open that little window. I'm going to expand this local server groups. And I'm going to add my Azure login here and get Management Studio to save it so I don't have to add it again. So for example, this was the database I set up in my Thursday class for our pet store. To connect to the database, I can now just double click it. I can see the database I created last week. So I'm going to do the same thing with the database we just created. So under local server group, I'm going to right click. I'm going to choose new server registration. So we're going to add and try to save the credentials for our Azure database. So our server will be our server name, whatever you called it, .database, .windows.net. The authentication is going to change. The Windows authentication, this works for a local database, but it doesn't work with Azure. So I'm going to change the authentication type from Windows to SQL Server. And when I do, this enables the login and password box. So now I need to add the username and password for my database. I also want to check Remember Password. So this way, whenever I want to connect to the database in the future, I can just double click it and I don't have to put in the password again. And then I can test out my connection. Management Studio will send a connection request to Azure and see if it can talk to the database. So I've got the right server name and my username and password. I'll click test. And this is by design. So testing the server failed, cannot open the server last chapter requested because the client with my IP address is not allowed to access the server. This behavior is by design. What does this mean? Why did I get this error? Trying to connect from Management Studio to the Azure portal. Right. By default, our databases on Azure are private. Exactly. They don't allow remote connections for security. So we have a couple of options. In the portal, I can whitelist my IP, and there's an option for that. We're going to look at it. However, that means I can only access my database if I'm here in my house. If I go to the college, if I go to a friend's house, and my girlfriend's, I don't have access. So rather than just whitelisting my IP, I'm actually going to create a firewall rule to allow any remote access, any IP in, as long as the credentials are right. So I'll click OK here. I'm going to leave this screen up. We'll come back to it in a minute. I'm going to go back to the Azure portal. Here's my database. And you'll notice here I've got this toolbar, copy, restore, export. And this fourth option says set server firewall. So we need this option here in the middle to create an IP rule. So I'll click Set Server Firewall. And now I have a few options here. If I just want my own IP address to what be whitelisted, I could click Add Client IP. But what I want to do is let in all IPs. I mean, this is the production database. Normally, we'd be a little more restrictive. So I'm going to let the rule with all. So starting from 0.0.0.0 .0 and ending in all 255s. So really, any subnet. As long as the user has the right credentials, let them connect to the database. And then I can just click the Save button up here. So when I click Save, Azure says it successfully updated my firewall. And now I can see the rule. It gets moved from those input boxes. It just shows up as static text on the page. I could also delete it if I wanted to. 
So now my IP should be whitelisted. So if I go back to Management Studio and test my connection, now it works. So I didn't make any changes here. The change I made was in the Azure portal. And then I can save my connection. So now if I want to connect to my database, it shows up here in my list of registered servers. I can just double click it. And now down here in my object explorer, here's my database. So I've got two databases running, local database that I'm going to use for my in-class project, Azure database. I'm going to use this one just so I can show you how to push publish the whole application, but your Azure database, you'll only need in your assignment. You do not have to run the last chapter database in the Azure service. Local will do. So that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Um, I, did, I did get questions last week in both of my Tuesday and Thursday sections, well, what do we have to do for next week? There will always be a checklist on D2L telling you. So you do have a quiz for this week. It's in the week four folder. Uh, make sure you follow it along with the in-class exercises we did, especially if you're doing the lesson asynchronously and the PowerPoint view syntax, it is graded. So you have until next Sunday to finish it. Make sure you set up SQL Server and Management Studio, and you can start planning out the model classes you need for assignment two. You can set up your Visual Studio project. You can start designing your models. Next week, you want to be here because <laughs> we're building models. We're building relationships. We're building our database tables. We're scaffolding controllers and views, and we're publishing the whole thing to Azure. So that's pretty much everything you need to do for your assignment we're going to be doing in class next week. Okay. So if you're a bit behind today on anything, you've got a week to catch up. You can email me if you need help. You can also book an office hours appointment if you need it. Please only book one at a time. I had a student yesterday who booked a whole kind of slew of appointments back to back. So please just book one. Um, all right. That's it, folks. Going to be a beautiful week. Hi, teens and sunny. So I hope you all have a good week. I will get the screencast uploaded a bit later today. And let me know if you need any help. Other than that, I'll see you next Monday.